Yes, welcome back. Uh, so before the break, we were looking at Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, uh, which says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition. You know, you, you approach God with prayer, which is just a general word for prayer. And you also approach him with petition. And that is the word deesis in Greek. And that word is used in a very nice way in James chapter 5, verse 16. So if we could have someone turn to James chapter 5 and read out just that one verse, James 5, verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Amen. Yes. So here, the first word that is used for pray, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. That's another word. That's another Greek word called euphomai. Um, so in the Philippian passage, we looked at prosuke, which is a common word. Here, there's another common word being mentioned, euphomai, which also is talking about prayer. Uh, but then when you come to the second portion of James 5.16, where it says the prayer of a righteous man, it's talking about the aces. So this is just not a casual prayer. This is a desperate prayer. There's some intense need. There's an emergency situation. And this person is crying out to God in that kind of a tense situation. And what does it say about this? the prayer of a righteous person who prays in such a situation? It says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So when we, the people of God, go to him with a deesis, with a petition, with a, with a prayer of urgency, you know, where we are desperately, sincerely crying out, such a prayer is powerful and it is effective. So whatever we are asking for, you know, the Lord will provide us, you know, according to his will. So we may not get the exact version of what we wanted, but he will answer that need that uh, that whatever it is that you require for that situation he will provide he will not let us down so this is the kind of prayer uh, this deesis when it is offered by a righteous person by a believer deesis is powerful and it is effective so therefore we can actually genuinely not be anxious about anything but in every situation with general prayer and with petition, with deesis, we go to God. There's one more thing that we add to this prayer and petition. We also add thanksgiving, is what it says. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Uh, so uh, why are we adding in the thanksgiving over here? It's basically us expressing and saying, Lord, I believe that you will indeed hear me that you will indeed help me. I trust you. I believe in your character. I believe that you are faithful. So therefore, I know that you will answer. You may not answer in exactly the way I want you, know, you to answer, but you will come to my help in my time of need. No way will you turn away from me. So no, because I know that, that confidently, I come with thanksgiving and I declare and say, yes, you will do this for me. You will help me in my time of need. Now we see David doing this again and again in his Psalms. So if you wanted a, a what an example of how this verse is actually you know practiced in real life, all you need to do is go to the Psalms. When you go to the Psalms, in many of the Psalms, you will see that David, you know, in the first portion of the Psalm, he cries out to God, he pours out his heart, he says, See, these are the things which are troubling me. Please come to my help, please hear me. You know, so he, you have all these desperate cries which are there. That is basically this poor man making his uh, prayer and his petition. And then he changes. You know, you, you notice that in many of the Psalms, he changes track and he starts talking about the nature of God. He starts saying, oh, God is mighty. God is faithful. He starts talking about the nature of God. And from there, he progresses to gratitude and he says, oh, Lord, someone like you, you will come to the help of your servant. You know, he ends with that confidence uh, that, yes, Lord, 
that is basically how you you practice philippians 4 6. you know you go to god you pour out your heart to him you know you you plainly tell him what you are feeling inside you know we don't need to pretend in front of god david was very frank you know in in expressing whatever was going on inside if he was feeling neglected as the god is far away he knows that god is not far away but you know that's the, that's the kind of feeling that he is having inside he openly expressed it and he would say lord why are you hiding from me and then halfway through the psalm he will say oh lord i know that you're there for the righteous your eyes are upon us so you know he he um, acknowledges the character of god and he brings in thanks giving into his prayer and he says lord someone like you who is faithful you will give us what we need so um we we you know like david instead of being anxious we too choose to go to the lord in everything with prayer with petition and with thanksgiving with the same kind of confidence which david displayed in his life so we we say yes lord this is your character this is your nature this is who you are therefore i thank you i know that you will not let me down you will not cause my face to be put to shame so you know he yeah uh, like david we choose to come with thanksgiving and we present our requests to god um when we do this god does verse 7 so verse 6 is our responsibility and when we approach him in this way verse 7 is something that god does from his side something which is divine something which cannot be done humanly by us it's something that only the lord can do for us when we come to him in this in this trusting manner what does he do it says the peace of god which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in christ jesus that word that is used over there that word guard you know that greek word over there that's basically talking about the guards who were used to um, to guard a city uh, city's gates uh, you know the um, you see the philip philippi you know we talked about how philippi was a roman city it's not under the rule of some locals who report to the romans no romans directly are uh, you know administering that particular place it's a roman city so the people living over there have roman uh, citizenship privileges so this city had a roman garrison you know guarding all of its gates so the Roman garrison made sure that no suspicious, suspicious elements will ever enter inside. They would make sure that no enemy ever comes inside. They protected and guarded the city of Philippi from all harmful, dangerous outsiders. The peace of God is going to be like this Roman garrison. The peace of God, it's going to be this, this divine thing which you cannot understand you know, through human knowledge. This kind of a divine peace is going to guard your heart and it's going to guard your mind and it's not going to allow certain things to come inside. What, is, what exactly is this peace of God guarding your heart and mind against? What is it protecting you from? You know, basically what he's talked about in the passage. That's basically what he's referring to. He talks about rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. So, you know, in your time of crisis, you, you choose not to grow bitter. You will not go into depression. Uh, you will not give up hope. So when such things come to you, you know, hope, uh, uh, thoughts of hopelessness, thoughts of anger and bitterness, when those things come to you, this peace of God will be like a guard and will and prevent those thoughts from coming and harming you and attacking you. Because from your side, you very faithfully, humbly came to him with an attitude of trust rather than being anxious you chose to come to him with prayer petition and even with thanksgiving so you did your part now the lord he will divinely keep those you no know, negative thoughts of this depression and despair and hopelessness away in the same way if there are angry bitter uh, grudgeful thoughts coming in your into your mind he will guard your mind from those things because you have made a choice to rejoice in him. You have made a choice to continue being gentle. So now he will divinely enable you to do those things. So he will guard you. And it's not, it, people looking at you will think, 
in a situation like this, how are you so calm? That's because this divine peace of God is standing there like a Roman garrison and helping you to maintain your peace, maintain your joy, maintain your confidence. You know, so he will do that from his side for us if we will approach him in this simple manner. So there are two sides to this uh, to this promise which is made in Philippians 4, 6 to 7. We do our part. God does his part. And of course, I would not say that our part is just the uh, verse 6. You know, it begins all the way from uh, uh, rejoice. And I say to you, I know, say to you again, rejoice. So right from verse 7 onwards up to, um, no, sorry. Where is my verse? Uh, uh, verse um, 4, is it? Yes. All the way from verse 4 to 4, 6. If I maintain the right attitude and do my part, then God will divinely make verse 7 happen. And people will literally see me just standing there firm, calm, able to handle the situation. Why? Because I have done verses 4, 5, 6. Now God will divinely take over and guard me from all these terrible, terrible attacks of the evil one, which you know would, would cause me to fall. He will do that from his side. So therefore, you know, we are asked to take up this approach rather than giving in to anxiety and uh, despair. Um, so, all right. Um, okay, there's, uh, there's something that I, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe I can just spend a few more minutes on this idea. We all know that we should not be anxious, uh, but then how not to be anxious? You know, so uh, there was this book that I read, which completely, you know, um, gave me a clear perspective on how to go about this in real life. Very simple. He, the man in his book, he's a counselor. He talks about two circles. He talks about this really large circle with a diameter of some six feet. And then he talks about a small circle. Uh, which has got a diameter of six inches. So he says, uh, when you're faced you know, with, with a situation where you're beginning to feel anxious, whatever you can do from your side, God expects you to do it. You know, so you prayerfully, with the help of God, you do what you need, what you, whatever you can. You write down those things in your little circle. You know, the Lord wants me to do this, this, this in handling the situation. But there are so many aspects to the situation which you which are outside your control. I mean, you need to be able to, you need to be God to be able to handle those things. I mean, you know, it's you, what you're doing is like so less and the situation is so big. So all the impossible aspects of your situation, put them in the big circle. That's the God circle. That's God's, you know, responsibility. He will take care of those issues. You just write down what you need to do in your little circle and you do that faithfully with the help of the Lord. And trust him that he will take care of whatever is there in the bigger circle. That just simple, that simple teaching completely changed my life. You know, because on a, every week we face situations where what we are what we are contributing to the situation is so little, little in no way is it going to resolve the problem. Because there are big issues involved in that problem. So ever since I learned this, I say, Lord. These bigger aspects of this thing, they are in your circle. It's your responsibility, Lord. You take care of it according to your wisdom and power in what way you think best. I know you'll never let me down. I am just going to focus on the little things which I need to do from my side. Oh, and it has worked beautifully so on so many occasions. He just wants that simple trust where you're not trying to meddle with his circle, saying, okay, and then, okay, what if he does it like this? You then it'll work against my interest. No, leave his circle to him. You stick to your circle and you do your part with the help of the Lord sincerely. It made this uh, Philippians, uh, this whole passage, you know, Philippians 4 from 4 to verse 7, very, very real. And I have seen the peace of God taking over because I'm exercising the simple attitude of trust. He just takes over and he will not allow me to be oppressed by all those depressing thoughts, those hopeless thoughts. No, now he is guarding my heart and my mind. And he helps me to operate at a higher level where now I'm able to stand firm in him. Okay, so this is this is something that has helped me a lot. So I thought maybe, yeah, it would be good to share that. Um, 
Now, moving on to the next thought, which Paul presents over here uh, in this chapter, um, verse 10 onwards, where he's talking about the love and the concern that these uh, Philippian believers have shown him and his attitude and his response towards what they are doing. It's not exactly you know what you would think. Uh, he does not handle this whole thing the way people generally do. He has his own outlook on this whole thing. It's nice. It's interesting. And we can learn things from here, from this. So if we could have someone read out for us, we are in Philippians chapter 4 right now. Uh, and if we could have someone read out for us from verse 10 up to verse 14. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, Philippians 4, 10 to 14, please. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now, at last, your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning... No, yeah, yeah, no, no, we will we'll come to that later because then it becomes too many thoughts. So we'll, we'll first focus on uh, the portion up to verse 14 uh, and yeah, uh, deal with that. So he says, you know, I know that you people are, really, are genuinely concerned about me. It's just that you didn't have an opportunity to show your concern because, you know, here I am in prison in Rome and you people, on the other hand, are out there in Philippi. But um, you finally decided that you're going to send Epaphroditus to me. And that's basically what he's referring to over here. He says uh, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Uh, and then later they show concern how by sending epaphroditus uh, so he refers to that in in chapter 2 where he talks about um you know philippians 2 25 he says whom you sent to take care of my needs so they were unable to take care of him from philippi so they sent epaphroditus to him so that epaphroditus can can cater to him on their behalf and uh, in philippians 2 30 he says no, he risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. So um, he's kind of referring to these verses here where he says, you know, you when you, when you finally got a chance to show concern for me, you did that. Um, and then he says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances the statement he's making over here is he's saying, even if you people had not sent Epaphroditus, I think the Lord would have strengthened me to continue being content and continuing to rejoice and continuing to, uh, you know, not be anxious. So, you know, whatever he has taught in the earlier verses, he has applied it to himself in various situations. So he's now kind of an expert on that. I mean, he does not say that, uh, but, you know, uh, which is why he says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances because whatever circumstance comes up against him this is basically what this man does. He rejoices in the Lord. He chooses to continue being gentle. He chooses to not be anxious. He goes with his prayers and petitions like a little child before God with thanksgiving. He does his part and this mighty power of God, you know, this, this Roman garrison or rather the divine garrison of God, this peace of God guards his heart and mind. And the man just stays content and calm in the most impossible situations. So he says, I have learned the secret of this. And he explains to these people what the secret is. He says, I can do all this through him who gives me the strength. So it's God who does it. It's not like, you know, he's ex extra strong or superior. And that is why he's able to stay content in all kinds of situations. Rather, it's because God gives him the strength he needs. So, um, you know, unlike a Roman garrison, which can maybe only help you help the city to an extent, this God of peace 
if we were to approach him in the right way, in the way where we are told to approach him in verses four to six, if we do that, this divine peace of God is a much more powerful garrison. He will guard our heart and mind in such a way that we will be just that we will be able to stay strong, no matter how bad the situation. He will empower us from his side. He will strengthen us from his side. It's such an amazing promise that we have. And in fact, we see an example of how you know Paul makes use of this strength of God, how God does this for him in the um, second Timothy letter, which he writes. Uh, if you know, remember, he, his first imprisonment happens, and then uh, he's set free. So uh, after he's set free, in fact, he comes and uh, visits these people, these Philippines, many, uh, many other times also, uh, is what we assume. And that's what historians say. So that is the first imprisonment. Then uh, he gets into his second imprisonment, out of which, in fact, he does not come out. He gets martyred. So uh, during his second imprisonment, that is when he writes the letter to uh, Timothy. He writes him two letters. In the second letter, like he's almost reaching the uh, last stages of his um, you know, life. So this is what he says about the strength of God in, the, uh, in, the, in that uh, second letter. So it's, uh, it's, it's a nice letter to read. I mean, it's, it, it's a nice um, uh, verse to read. So if we can go to 2 Timothy verse chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, if someone could read out verses 16 and 17, and we'll connect it to this passage which we are we've just talked about. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, please. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 16 to 17. No, I'm reading good news. No one stood by me the first time I defended myself. All desert, all disaster me. My may God not count it against me. Verse 17. But the Lord stayed with me and gave me strength, so that I was able to proclaim the full message of all the Gentiles to hear. And I was rescued from being sentenced to death. Yeah, so it looks like in this um, you know, the second arrest, which is a much more serious arrest. I guess he's had to go to the court a few times. So he says the first time that he went, you know, during his first defense. So I guess they had a series of, um, you know, um, court appearings. And I suppose in the last court appearing, they, you know, they declared a death sentence. And that's basically how he gets martyred. So this is basically he's talking about his first defense, by which time everyone had already finished deserting him. Because now they realize this man is going to get a death sentence. And so anyone who's friends with him, will also, you know, come under the eyes of the Roman authorities. So better to, you know, distance ourselves from this person so that we will not get trapped along with him and get dragged down along with him. So in that manner, you know, he's going for a, for this court appearing. It's a rather tense situation. Uh, it's a matter of life and death. He doesn't know what exactly he's going to say, what words he's going to speak, how he's going to defend Christ, because, you know, that's his goal. He doesn't, he doesn't really care so much about death and life. You know, he for him it's very important how he's going to present Christ in front of those people, those authorities, get them to listen. So he must have been quite, you know, anxious about the, all, all of this. And uh, it would have been so nice if there was somebody to stand along with him, you know, during this time, some familiar face in the court. But no, there's nobody over there, not even one supporter. Everyone has deserted him and you know distanced uh, themselves. So he literally has only one person standing next to him. When he makes his first defense, he says, the Lord stood at my side and he says, gave me strength. It's such a personal picture. I mean, it's so beautiful. So this man, he has learned, you know, Philippians uh, 4 verses 4 to 6. So practiced it so many times that now he has this very personal relationship with his Lord. He knows that even if everyone else is gone, the Lord is going to be there standing right next to him giving him the strength that he needs to face that situation. The peace of God is guarding him, you know, strengthening him, enabling him. Um, and uh, so in that particular first defense, I know they kind of, uh, yeah, they rule in his favor. So he's spared from the lion's mouth. 
but yeah, at some latter point of time, he does get uh, martyred. So uh, he says, I have learned in the, coming back to our Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 onwards, he says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. In verse 12, he says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So we, just like Paul, we can have this confidence that in, in our time of crisis, even if everyone else has distanced themselves and you know drawn back, the Lord will stand by our side. Personally, like literally, he will stand there next to us and give us the strength that we need step by step, moment by moment, as we are going through that really difficult situation. Therefore, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, come to him confidently because he's this kind of a God who will stand by your side even when everyone else has, uh, you know, abandoned us. Uh, so, um, so the secret to Paul's contentment is that he just relied on the Lord's strength, and I think he just kind of left uh, let God deal with the big circle. You know, I mean, because whether the whether he's going to be given a death sentence or not. That is not under his control. I mean, it's beyond his control. From his side, what, what can he do? You know, he can prepare himself mentally to say, OK, these are the words I'm going to speak. When they, when, they, when they question me, this is what I will say in my defense. He can only take care of the little parts, you know, which are in his ability. The bigger things, that's in, entirely in God's control. I mean, exactly in what kind of a mood will the judge come that day to the court? It's not in his control. You know, I mean, uh, what exactly are the questions which they're going to raise? He doesn't know that that's in God's control. There are a lot of things sitting in the big circle. And it's good to just leave those things there in that big circle. Let God be God. You don't have to try and play God and you know keep uh, playing out scenarios in your mind saying, oh, maybe he'll come in this mood. Or maybe he will judge like this. Maybe he'll ask me this question. All that's outside your control. You're not even supposed to be dwelling on the big circle. Stick to your little circle. Do your part. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Continue to be gentle, not be anxious, come with your prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, and you see how God will work on your behalf. I mean, uh, um, things may go against you, things may go in your favor, but the Lord who is there with you, in the end, he will work it all out for your good, because he will never do anything which goes against your interests. So we leave it in the Lord's hands. So I think that was the secret of Paul's contentment. He would just leave it all on the Lord's shoulders. Lord, you do what you want. You take care of it in your way. The strength which I need to go through it, that you're going to give it to me moment by moment. So he was very God-focused. He kept his eyes on the Lord rather than looking at the situation. And this helped him you know, so, uh, to stay strong in all kinds of circumstances. So he says, yes, I was having a tough time. You know, We're now talking about the past imprisonment, we're talking about the Philippian letter. So he says, yes, I was I mean, going through a tough time. Uh, and it's good that Epaphroditus came to me. But even if he had not, I think I would have managed fine because the Lord would have strengthened me, he would have taken care. You know, on the other hand, how, you know, how do a lot of people in ministry react today? You know, they're like so desperate for help from people. I mean, I've never seen this. I've seen this, you know, I mean, um, I mean, because we interact with a lot of other people in ministry, right? So I've, I've just seen that there's such a sense of desperation around them. It's like, you know, anyone who says, you know, oh, any help that I can give your ministry, you know, they like literally pounce on that person and say, yes, yes, please, you know, you can do this, you can do that. There's such a sense of desperation uh, among people in ministry just because we don't have, you know, finances in our hands. Paul was never like that. Paul was content. He knew his Lord would take care. So even if someone would go to him and say, no, you know, I want to help, he would say, good. You know, the Lord will reward you for what you're doing, because that's basically the point which he comes to next. He's not so much, uh, you know, uh, so happy that, oh, that finally someone has come to rescue me. Rather, you know, he says, I'm glad, you know, you people came and helped because now God is going to reward you. Because he knows that he could have managed even if they had not come. The Lord is going to stand next to him and strengthen him and help him. He was so God-focused. 
that is the way we need to be in our ministries not always desperately looking you know for which person who will come and help and you know whom i can you know um, be extra nice to so that maybe they will you know, treat me with favor let us not have that beggarly attitude let us instead be uh, you know like ambassadors of christ who have been called by him into that particular ministry so he will provide he will send the people that we need we don't have to be desperate we can have the same attitude that all did over here who says i would have been content even if you had not come but i'm so glad that you did because you know you will receive a great reward for it he talks about in about that in one of the latter verses we have not yet reached there uh, let's instead look at um, uh, the verses which come before that uh, yeah he, now he's making a point about these uh, philippians and the other macedonian churches he's talking about the beautiful attitude which these people had so if we could read uh, verses 14 15 16 yeah maybe we can go all the way up to yeah uh, okay from 14 uh, if we can go all the way up to 18 14 to 18 again a lot of uh, very you know valuable lessons that we can learn verses 14 to 18 please Philippians four, fourteen uh, to eighteen, please. Verse fourteen. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica. you sent aid once and again for my necessities not that i seek the gift but i seek the fruit that abounds to your account indeed i have all and abound indeed i have all and abound i am full having received from epaphroditus the things sent from you a sweet smelling aroma an acceptable sacrifice well pleasing to god yeah now here in this portion is something told about the philippian church specifically and uh, in fact also it refers to the other macedonian churches so he there's a point that he makes over here uh, in in philippians 4 uh, verse 15 he says moreover as you philippians know in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel when i set out from macedonia not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only for even when i was in thessalonica you sent me aid more than once when i was in need um you know so he's talking about how these philippians were so committed to helping him supporting him financially which sounds like a nice thing but then you get to know a little more detail when you refer to paul's other letters uh you know second corinthians chapter 8 Verses one to seven, where Paul actually talks about these Macedonian churches. Um, when you when you when you use the term Macedonian churches, it's basically going to be talking about uh, you know, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. Okay, these three places. In Second Corinthians eight verses one to seven, we get to know that these churches were not financially well off. Yes, you had some big shots. You know, like uh, Lydia, who was a uh, purple. Uh, cloth merchant uh, the jailer who was in a good position because you know he was he was in charge of the entire prison uh, so that would have been an important position so yes there were some big people in the church but we get to know in second corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 to 7 that most of the people in these churches were dirt poor i mean like seriously poor because that's the wording that is used you know paul is talking about these guys in Yeah, to the Corinthians, and he's telling, he's boasting about the about these uh, Philippians and these Macedonians, and this is what he says about them when he's you know telling the Corinthians about them. He says, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. I mean, like really high words to say about anyone. He says these guys are in very severe trial. 
you know, like they maybe the maybe the locals are all against them, you know, because they've gone into this uh, uh, this this Christian uh, faith and they have given up all their pagan customs, all their local culture. So the maybe the locals really hate them and they're undergoing a lot of persecution. So he says one thing: these people out there, you know, in the Macedonian region, very severe trial. Second thing, overflowing joy. So the outcome of their uh, very severe trial is not depression. The, the outcome of their very severe trial is that these guys are overflowing with joy. And combined with these two things, there's also extreme poverty. Like they're like really poor. So I'm just uh, making an assumption. Maybe they lost their Roman, um, some of their Roman rights and uh, privileges, you know, after having uh, moved to the Christian faith. You know, maybe there were others who are angry with them. Maybe were blocking off their rights and privileges. I mean, we don't know why they were that. They were, they were this poor. But here are these people going through severe trial, extreme poverty, and the third, you know, aspect of of it is not depression. It's overflowing joy. And these these three things they come together to make them want to be as generous as they possibly can. So what do these really, really poor people who are undergoing great persecution, what do they do? You know, they, um, they he says in verse 3, the Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3, he says, they went beyond their ability in giving. I mean, what they actually could not afford to give, they just simply gave it away, you know, trusting that God will somehow provide for them. That's the attitude with which they gave. And then he says in verse 4 over there, you know, he's talking to the Corinthians and telling them about these people. And he says, you know what? They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service. So, you know, they, they wanted to have the honor of being able to give to ministry in this way. I mean, what hearts these people had. Amazing people, the Philippians and, you know, also the Thessalonians and the Bereans. What a people. They are going through severe persecution. They are like dirt poor, extremely poor. And it's causing them to trust in God in such a way that it, it, he's, 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 he's causing them to literally overflow with joy. And out of the joy and gratitude, they're like giving away money which they don't even have. You know, they're not even keeping anything back for their own expenses. They are giving beyond their ability. And uh, so, in fact, they urgently beg and say, please allow us to do this for the ministry. And uh, so, you know, <laughs> Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthians, he's saying, you know, these are the kind of guys that you people are competing with. So when you please give your contributions, please give decently, you know, is what he tells them, uh, tells the Corinthians in the Corinthian letter. So this is the kind of people the Philippians were. They were not in a nice situation. So for them, when Paul said to them, you know, do not be anxious in anything, but in everything, just go to him with prayer, petition, thanksgiving. And the peace of God is going to do something remarkable for you. So for that, you know, for them, those words would have been very encouraging. So to these people, he says, not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. He says, I know that because you guys are giving in this manner, there's going to be such a great reward upon your heads. And that fills me with joy. So I'm not happy that you gave me the money. God would have found some other way of giving me the money. That's not the point. The point is that you're going to be rewarded. So we need to have that kind of an attitude in our ministry. Where is the reality is that maybe, you know, we really do not have much funds, but we are rejoicing in the Lord. We are looking to him. So our eyes are on him. And we are grateful for the people who are coming forward to give us, but we are not desperate for them. Even if they walk away to another ministry to give because the Lord has led them away, no props. You know, we will not get desperate because we are confident. So rather than you know saying, oh, I'm so glad you came and saved my life, what we would say is that I'm so glad that you are going to be so richly rewarded because as for my life, oh, God will have taken care of it in some other way. That beautiful confidence that Paul had, we need to reflect that in our own ministries, in our own situations. So he says, not that I desire your gifts, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. And then he goes on to make these statements. He talks like a rich man because he is a rich man. He says, I have received full payment and I have more than enough. I am amply supplied. No, uh, that is the way you guys have provided to me. And uh, 
what you have done is now a fragrant offering to the lord he says and so because you have done it in this manner the lord will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory so he says i'm so happy the way you guys have given it's like i have received full payment i have more than enough i have been amply supplied the this is the way you have you people have given and i'm telling you this is going to be a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to god and because you have given in this manner god will meet all not some all your needs according to the riches of his glory now you know in our christian walk we kind of take just take this verse out 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 from its beautiful context and we just say oh the lord will meet all your needs but look at what these people did you know to have that kind of a lavish uh, response from god they were living with that kind of a christ attitude you know where they wanted to serve where they were willing to sacrifice to the point uh, beyond what they can because they were having that kind of hearts these are one bunch of people who never have to worry about whether god will take care or not most definitely because of this beautiful fragrant offering that they are so sacrificially offering to the lord the lord will you know paul says you guys don't have to worry god will definitely meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory so it must have pinched it must have pained it must have hurt to give like that you know i mean they had families to look after they had a church to run but in spite of their own needs they did this for god so they were they were doing it as a sacrifice to him to the lord not so much just for paul of course they loved paul but they are doing it for him to their for their savior and the lord would have responded by meeting all of their needs according to his riches so we got to take chapter 4 in all of its completeness you know we, we if you pull out just one verse here and there we don't really grasp the 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 spiritual teaching that is being carried in these verses you know that that paul originally wanted to convey so when we when we look at the entire chunk in its entirety we kind of get a bigger picture of what paul was trying to convey to these uh, philippians um so um, he is pleased with them uh, he encourages them and um, yeah i think that's about it i am whatever we needed to cover in this chapter we have covered all right so yeah as there are no questions we shall maybe conclude with a word of prayer yeah um let's pray lord we just thank you so much that we could learn so much from these philippian believers oh lord lord in spite of their difficult circumstances uh the persecution and the poverty they were overflowing with joy that shows oh lord that they had their eyes on you they did not look at the situations um they chose instead to depend upon you and rejoice in you and because they had that attitude the peace of god really guarded them and enabled them to overflow with joy rather than overflow with depression thank you oh lord that you did that for them and because oh lord you care about all of your children in the same way what you did for them you will do even for us help us oh lord from our side uh, to practice uh, philippians 4 4 to 6 and even as we are doing our part oh lord you will do your part we thank you oh lord that we can have this kind of a complete dependency and reliance on you knowing that you will come through for us no matter what the situation so we pray oh lord uh, that you would uh, cause us to be people who always boast only in you not in our works not in our badges of honor and we pray that our eyes will always stay only on you so that you can do these marvelous things in our life through your power thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you so much so next class we will begin with uh, colossians